Well, Kia, we just have been meeting for the, for the class portion of that. There's five of us here that are in the class. And we just began talking today about, um, of course, the notion of diversity and equity, but also leadership and also passion. And, and um, I know that there's a lot of things that you have been saying about that. We also um, read your recent interview as a preparation for today. And um, I know mm. a number of us have, qu have questions for you, but I also know there were some things you wanted to share perhaps first. So... Please, oh, can uh, we do the uh, can we do the opposite and ask the questions first? Sure. <laughs> oh, yay! That'd yeah, be great. That'd absolutely. be great. Well, I've got like ten of them, but I'm not going to hog it here. So, uh, if there, <laughs> is there anybody else who would like to kick off the questions? And this is my favorite thing: a closed mouth don't get fed. That's leadership one on one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Jill, start them off so they get comfortable and they realize I'm real candid. We'll, we'll get them there. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to kick us off here and break the ice. Um, you um, talked in the interview that I read recently that mm -hmm. um, you like to, you're, you're passionate about concept for a project. Oh. And in fact, you, you like to, to link that to story with the idea of enhancing a community through it. Now, I'm, I'm fascinated by that because there are many different approaches and thoughts about concept amongst designers. Some, some designers mm. don't like concepts, some do, but you seem to harness concept for a purpose. So can you tell me about that? Yes. Okay. For me, a concept is about bringing historical moments context, figures, people, textures, and colors into the design process, right? So for example, we we are working, we were working on Berry Farm here in DC, right? Um, it's located in the Hillsdale area, right? Um, Berry Farm, one of the largest public housing redevelopment pro projects happening here in DC. Um, DC is named for go-go music, right? The junkyard band, right? Go-go music is all about sight touch, sound, it's like this immersive experience. Um, the, the yard at Howard University, HBCU here, was named after Howard Schultz. Howard Schultz was one of the leaders and founders of the Berry Farm Redevelopment. So the yard is this place where people gather and come together, right? Anacostia used to be like a fishing port um, and everyone would come to the center. So our concept for this project became opening the senses to ascension, right? So how do we get there? Go-Go is all about the, the, the senses, right? It's a sensory experience. Uh, ascension, we talked about hills and dales, so it's moving you up, very subtle, it's not bold. Um, it's about these centralized moments and the community story. So for this particular project, we did a couple things. We touched the ceiling with these swooping movements, right, of kind of reminiscent of the hill, right? Um, uh, the centralized lobby is reminiscent of the yard, but then this immersion piece comes in where we did this interactive art installation where we took the names of historical figures from that community and we did it on the main wall in the lobby. So as people move throughout this space, the names of historical prominent fixtures from teachers to go-go -go music to Eartha Kitt to one of the first soldiers from the Vietnam War who are from Anacostia, it lights up on the wall. So it encourages, again, movement, sensory experience. You see it with your eye, right? So our concept dictated all those design decisions. Not that this is gonna be mid-century modern and contemporary, that's bullshit, right? The story and the elements are about the people, right? So what do people buy into in business, right? People, right? Brands are about people. You don't, you, you know Richard Branson um, and you buy into Virgin Atlantic or Virgin Airlines, right? So the concept is so important because it is pulled directly from the community story. Who makes up communities? People. So if I tell my client that we have pink polka dots, yellow stripes, and glitter because it goes back to the people story, that's how I get them to do what I say, right? Not because, you know, Sherman Williams' color of the year is midnight moonlight, right? It's what's the story, what's the why, it goes to the greater context of the community 
that's why concept is so important to me. And that trickles down from everything to the finishes, to the furniture, to the fabrics, to the art, right? It's, it's a why, right? So when they say, well, why did you do that? Oh, well, our concept was this. Right. And I think in school and education, it's like, oh, well, this is what concepts sound like. And I see them all the time. We, we wanted the juxtaposition of biophilic spaces and natural light. That, what, what are you saying? Right. Those are all things in the 25 cent word. Strip it down to the people in the context of the community. And that's how you make every project specific to that community. Right. And if it's a predominantly black community like Berry Farm. Right. In, in, in 5, 10, 15 years when that neighborhood gentrifies, whether it's an affordable housing bu building or a building for, you know, a young couple, um, you're going to see the name of Black people on that wall as you walk in the front door, right? Mm -hmm. So the concept is about maintaining the history and the fabric, and that's how we do that, especially because 90% of our work is affordable low-income housing, which depending on where you are in, in the world, is black and brown community. So concept is the way we maintain that that history, that 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 data, um, that character, and it's our why. I can tell you every reason why we made a design decision. It goes back to the people. That's why concept is so important. And I think in the rush, right, for deliverables, right, you you see firms who have like pictures of other people's interiors and say, well, we were going for something. No, 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 no. It is against the law. I don't think we have a lot of hard and steadfast rules in my firm and my team knows this, but you will never, ever, ever put another picture of another interiors in any of our presentation. And this is what we do in school. But it's a precedent photo, fuck precedent, design it, create it, right? The imagery that we use is nature, fabric, textile, art, um, fashion, people, skin tones. Those are the images that we use when we're doing our, our concept development. Um, I wish I could pull up this presentation we're giving tomorrow. I think my, my team member wouldn't like that. Um, but in it, you know, in school, you have your little parties. And I, I never under, I get it, right, in the big grand, grand scheme of things. But she took her concept imagery, right? Um, and then she started doing what she called these concept movements. Well, all the elements and movement she saw in her in her concept imagery, she then translated it to the floor plan, right, uh, to the space plan. So this is why con it's the money. And a lot of firms aren't doing this because they are too busy grasping at other interiors, doing a little sticky charrette to see what the client likes, instead of creating a story that they have to buy and you have to sell that's about the people concept is, is people are like how do you get them to do what you say the concept i have a solid why for every design decision we make so that was a very wordy but i get really passionate about concept <laughs> i noticed in what you said something very interesting and, and seemingly sad you speak to the the perhaps the inevitability of uh, a project you've been working on to be gentrified mm -hmm. is this just I mean, something that naturally happens all the time and what do you think about that so I think any any major metropolitan area, right, where there was some historical community of color, right, you hear words like oh, revitalization, um, re revitalizing, um, we're going to do these urban renewal projects, it's just fancy ways of saying gentrifying, right? Um, and it's how do you, you know, how do you design and not displace? How do you design and and then also realize that some of these communities have been disenfranchised and they do re need reinvestment and development is that. So there is no um, right or wrong answer yet, um, but it's kind of like, well, the, the, what I can do, my contribution to that is making sure, you know, if it's a mixed com building, if there's an affordable building and a market rate building, you won't be able to tell the, decision, the, the difference between the design outcomes because we've designed it with such intentionality, right? So, you know, you think about developers and multifamily, it's about dollars. If it don't make dollars, it don't make sense, right? So they, they're gonna sit on that asset and hope that when the market, when it fully transitions or gentrifies, it might turn into a mixed income or market rate building. But by God, you're still gonna have a story of the people who were there. Um, that's really, really important to me. Mm -hmm. Until I transition into development and just become a developer, we're going to use design as the as vehicle. Is that fair? 
questions, folks? Hey, Hi. Hannah. Hey. Um, so I was reading your interview and I saw like in the, one of the first questions she asked, how did your interest in design first develop? And I was really intrigued when you said, I believe the universe was always guiding me. How did you like come about with that idea? Like, uh, because, because, and this is the thing. So what, what interview was this that you guys read? Cause there's like been a lot lately. So I was like, what did I say? Uh, was um, this interior design or magazine? I'll have to go look and see who the author was. Okay, well, just put it in the chat. So this is how I feel like it. Because when I tell people how I got to interior design, right, it's like, it's the visiting my brother in prison story, it's the military story. So I think, I, I, I feel like the universe led me there because those are some random ways to realize space mattered, right? Uh, and to realize that like interior design is a thing. So when people, someone asked me today, like, oh, what do you do for your profession? I was like, well, this is, I think, my, this is my purpose, right? Um, there's no other way I would have gone here if this wasn't my purpose. And I think it's also allowing things to unfold naturally. Ah, Madam Architecture, got it. Uh, it's allowing things to unfold naturally. Um, I, I read something recent. It was like people who have control issues are really just, it's just a sphere, right? We've just. We've just, you know, we've disguised it as needing to be in control um, and leaning into the universe and allowing things and opportunities and career paths to un unfold is about trusting what you're doing is bigger than yourself, right? It's leaving my ego at the door and remembering, um, and I've been bringing this word back into my language a lot of service. I'm a service provider. I serve the people. I serve communities. And I think we get so caught up in industry trying to sound more heady and say, I'm an interior architect, and I should say, whatever, right? But no, we serve people. We serve communities. And I think opportunities come, come to you um, unexpectedly when you do it from a place of service of others first. And I think, you know, for me, you know, visiting my brother, it wasn't about for me, how indignified the experience was, it was about how it was indignified for the children going to visit their fathers, the spouses, the guards, right? And then the men, right? In the military, it really wasn't about, you know, uh, and that was about me because I needed a place to cry like a baby. So that was about me. Uh, but it was just realizing like, man, if this is, if I needed space like this, do other people need space? And I think the universe allowed me to get to this point even as a business owner, right? Um, everyone said, how did you know it was time to start your business? I, I think when I, when I was disenchanted with my current employee, my employer at the time, it wasn't like, I would wanna go be the boss. I was just like, well, I wanna work for a firm where people look like me and have leadership that looks like me. Is there one? I was like, no, okay. Well, maybe I need to build one for someone else. So I think, again, it goes back to, I wasn't doing it because I wanted to be the boss and be in control, right? I wanted to build something for myself that, for, that I didn't see for myself that I felt like other people might teach me too. And the universe has just constantly unfolded. Again, my first project, right? When I started my business, I had come from hospitality, market rate design. And the first project I did, right? I started a business, no savings, no nothing, no six months of your salary, no business plan. I started my business under the mindset of like, gosh, um, this is the only option. And the first thing I did was a nonprofit project. And it's like, you don't start a business and then do free work, right? Again, the universe unfolded itself. So I did this domestic violence project, um, project for 12 women and 32 women, 32 children. And they didn't think they needed design. They didn't think they had access to it. They thought they could only see it on TV. And had I been about, well, I just got to start my business and make some money, I wouldn't have had heard the most, the statement that just shook me to my core when the woman said, when I walked into this room, I realized change was possible for me, right? Because I showed up to serve her. And then that made me realize the people who need access to well-designed spaces the most, they don't know they don't have it, they don't know they need it, and they don't have an advocate. So I need to serve those communities. And that unfolded, right? Who quits a job, do free work, and then find their mission? The universe. Is that fair? And I, I could keep going on and on and on and on, but that's how I feel like it 
I trust it a lot more. In between, like, trying to balance your P&L, overhead costs, all that other stuff, timing is everything. Um, you just got you just got to trust it. Is that fair? Yeah. Laura, were you about to unmute yourself? Did you have a question? I did have a yeah, question. Yeah, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> so you were talking about, um, like, designing for people that don't know that they need it and just, like, really serving people. How do you approach it to like really get through to them that you can help them and like you have the knowledge and resources that can make their lives better? What, so good question, right? Um, you ever think about when you were a kid and you wanted to learn how to do something and your your parents, they sat down and they did it with you, right? You know, they showed you how to write your letters, right? I think it's the same thing. <clears throat> We've become a lot more intentional in creating this immersive process into our design process with our clients and the communities that we serve. So for example, we have this new project in Boston called Whittier Place. So as soon as we get, we know we're getting the project, we do a couple of things, right? We, we, got, we reach out to a local university. Um, we look for two to three students who reflect the community to work on this project. Then they are required to then find a high school a high school um, school in the community, um, and then we get two to three students who reflect the community to come to the project. And then we even are starting to go to the, like the grade school, middle school level, right? So sometimes it's about doing things with the people that you're serving and not just for them, to for them to understand the process of it, right? Uh, so that's the model we do on all of our projects. So we're doing a couple of things when we do that. We're showing them like, wow, okay, this is the process of what it takes to build space community. Wow, this is what it's like to have agency to create, to be a part of a building that's being um, developed in my community. Wow, is this something I could do one day, right? Uh, it's making the standard not just going to the community when you got to check the checkbox for the, the funding requirement. It's immersing all the constituents in the process, whether that's an artist, a nonprofit association, right? Um, that's what we do. And I think it's educating about the process, not just that design matters. If you explain something to someone, they'll receive it in a different type of way. And most people have this mindset that you have to give to low-income people. Here, take what we give you. And really, let's talk about it. Let's dialogue. This is how we crafted this concept and this story based off of the history of your community. How do you see it? What do you know that we don't know? Because you live there, right? You've lived there. Uh, that's how we, we create this kind of intentional approach um, to having them understand space matters design is a path and you can have agency in creating your space and community. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you've talked an awful lot about um, leadership and you very clearly have taken the initiative to create your situation. You uh, mm -hmm. created your first design coordinator position at the hotel management company because it didn't exist, but you saw a need. In our class, we're talking a lot about leadership and i think you exemplify a change maybe a watershed moment going on in design right now where designers are no longer sitting back and waiting for work to come to them they're going out and figuring yeah. out what the problems are and they're interjecting their their expertise into it um what could you say but, about but isn't that what design is right i think that's what we're taught right there is a problem we, like everyone's like oh design thinking and you guys are in a program where it's all about design thinking, right? So you're equipped with the tools to ask the tough questions, assess the situation, see a problem, come up with multiple ways to possibly solve it, right? Um, that's what leadership is, assessing the weak points. Uh, it's leadership and then it has to be the courage component, right? Um, I, w I was talking to an architect today and he was like, yeah, and I was challenging some of their notions around how they design affordable housing, blah, blah, blah. And he says, yeah, but we, we don't like to bite the hand that feeds us. And I was like, oh, I bite it all the time. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, you do. And you've been successful, right? Leadership, and I'm going to sound like I'm, like I'm beating a dead horse here. Leadership is about, is what I'm saying beneficial to more people? Not just myself, 
but to more people. And to be a leader, it takes courage to say sometimes uncomfortable things. But I'm not saying those uncomfortable things for my benefit. I'm saying those uncomfortable things, one, because no one else has said it. And nine times out of 10, once you do say it, someone else was thinking it. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm glad you said that, right? So if you're approaching problem solving and design thinking skills to the, to the greater good of other people, you, you, people will follow you to the well. Uh, they will follow you to the well and know that it's not your ego showing up. It's, it's this idea of the problem needs to be assessed and fixed and changed. And, 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 and I never really do it in a disrespectful way, right? Um, that, that's, that's, that's leadership also mean, it means situational awareness, right? Nine times out of 10, I walk in a room. Uh, I'm the only person of color. I, I'm the perceived younger person. Um, and I'm just a designer girl, right? Uh, so you have to assess really quickly, okay, who needs to have the biggest ego in the room? And I'm going to let you have it, right? Again, it's like whatever you need to be the loudest, this and that, and I'm clearly that person too, but a leader knows when to turn it up, when to turn it down, right? Uh, because again, if I grow in there trying to beat my chest and be the loudest, that who is that serving? Me? or the people, right? Um, and that to me is what makes this idea of design thinking is knowing when to pause, take a step back. You have two ears and one mouth for a reason. Um, and then assess the problem, find ways, provide critiques and solutions. And I think that's how I, that's how I, got, I got that design coordinator job. I didn't just have a critique, I had a solution. I had a solution that was advantageous to everyone in the process and also myself, but that's, that's what leadership is really, really about. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Any other questions? Don't be scared. I don't bite. Curse, yes. Bite, no. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any um, tips or like strategies for getting to like a beautiful end goal, but with a lower budget for a project that you may have? Yeah, I have a concept, right? So this, so this is the new thing that's happening, right? And my things are my face like crazy. So I tell people I do affordable housing, and they go, "Oh my God, should we? Um, do you want us to donate this discontinued wall covering?" And I'm like, "No." Well, we have we have this fabric, and we have these like leftover coffee table books. Are you going to need those? And I'm like, "No." Um, we use. We, we have a project that's coming out of the ground, 100% affordable housing, 104 units, all new construction. We did not have to VE out a single fixture, finish, or element. We have all, if you're familiar with Sonneman lighting, Sonneman lighting in every common area. Um, we have wall covering, millwork. Um, we have a $20,000 custom backlit cool edge system illuminating a metal grill that represents the site that we flipped in turn because our concept was um, dividing points along the boundaries, right? So we were strategic in our use of finishes and materials. So what does that mean? So you think about a multifamily project, 104 units, you got tile in a few places, right? You got tile on the bathroom floor, tile on the wall in the shower, tile on the backsplash, in the lobby, in the common air bathroom, you might have some decorative fancy tiles somewhere else. So what designers do, we'll get a style from Stone Source, ceramic technique, dowel tile, a little bit of something from ANSAC, maybe something from Tile Bar, and then something from other, some other place in Italy, right? So we just got eight different tile manufacturers, right, on this job. So what do we what I always say, people, right, understanding the process. Before a resident moves into the building, who is the last person touching that tile? The subcontractor, right? So depending on where you live, um, the subcontractor might be a small to mid-sized minority firm, right? So you just ask a subcontractor to go to possibly nine different vendors right? That's nine different ways to get paid order. If you if that subcontractor hasn't ordered from ANSAC 
he might not get the discount as the bigger person. And all these things kind of play into, well, if I use ceramic techniques for every piece of tile on that project, I can pick up my rep, my phone and say, hey, Nancy, look, we got Capital Vista coming down the pipe pipeline we're going to give you the unit bath the backsplash lobby all the tile now we have more buying power right that's how we're able to design um we also have this good better best mindset where we we again design thinking right multiple ways to solve the problem uh on this one project called momentum at shady grove we did this um a concept with domes etched in travel we did this millwork wall in the lobby where we had these three-dimensional wood panels that came out at varying depths. Then we did a recessed linear fixture on the face of it, right? So we designed it for the developer to do it three ways, with wood veneer, which is really expensive, wood laminate, or wood wall covering. So at no point was the design intent going to be diminished because we thought about three ways to solve the solution, right? And we're going to jump back to Capital Vista. Um, light fixtures, right? It's understanding that, oh, man, lighting and lighting subcontractors, that is the shadiest and the least transparent process, right? So you would go into a hotel lobby, you see a big, shiny, sparkly fixture, and it's like it's hanging, it's everything, right? And then if you try to specify that on an affordable housing project, they're like, oh, that fixture is $20,000. Is it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, who's, why? Why is it $20,000? Like, our job is to ask why. So when you keep asking why, what you find out is the fixture is really $5,000. It's just been marked up by three different people that is so exorbitant that now it can't stay on the job. So, again, problem, solution, oh, well, we're going to purchase the light fixtures. And what I pay for it is what we're going to give it to the client for, right? Because in design, if we're marking things up, so exorbitantly that it doesn't make it accessible to all people, then that's a part of the problem, right? What is luxury, this notion of luxury, right? It's like, who, who says I can't give the client the light fixture at my cost? Nobody, right? Problem, solutions, right? So is my general contractor upset that I challenged him and forced him to be transparent? Oh, yeah, okay, but I'm not there for him. I'm there for the community, and it's the people. So we don't need to use cheaper materials or furnishings or any of that. We force transparency and we control the process of procurement to make sure that things aren't so marked up that they're exorbitant. That's how we're able to do what we do. Um, and, and then it's understanding volume, right? Uh, one of our projects, we use Bolon. It's a woven textile made in Sweden. You see it a lot in hotels, restaurants, in Europe, in Europe. And our architect, our architect partner was like, we've never used that before. We always do carpet tile in the corridors. And I'm like, okay. And the carpet tile always looks like crap. Or the, the property management always complains. Then they get that 10% attic stock, and they never pop out the one tile. And then if you do, you can, you can really recognize that one tile. So we push them to use an innovative material like Bolon. It is installed at the same price point as a carpet or an LVT. And now we walk the side and like, oh, my God, yeah, that flooring is so great. Yeah, I know, but you tried to fight me. Um, then I work on that with my therapist and all that aggression. Um, but this is how it's not about – and Bolon is like a, a, a top-of-the-line hospitality product on affordable housing. So I don't need to use lesser quality materials. I just need to understand, you know, buying power, being strategic, um, and the purchasing process, and then disrupt that. Is that fair? I have a follow-up question to that, because I think something that many designers have thought about, you know, they, they do a lot of projects, such as the ones that you engage with as pro bono work, but I think they may <laughs> shut away from this type of project for alternative client populations because they think that there's an insufficient profit in it what would you say oh, oh i tell oh, oh, i tell oh, so outside of people thinking like i need donated material oh my god did you do this work for free no i make a lot of money good good money i'm a black woman leading a creative practice doing a mission-based work 
that has seen revenue growth and client growth year over year over year over year, right? It's not about that doing community work means you can't make money. It's leading with the mission, right? So instead of me trying to get um, every project, I can be a little bit more strategic in my outreach to going after the right clients, right, the right partners. Um, and that's another language shift I want to talk about instead of saying clients and partners. But, and, and this is the thing, problem solving, right? No one was tending to these developers. Mm -hmm. Everyone just assumed, oh, affordable housing developers, they don't use interior designers. Well, well why not? Oh, because they don't think these people deserve it. Well, why not? Who's challenging them? Who, who's like, why? Right? And one of the things that I learned is uh, most of my development partners, they're like, yeah, here, our architects, they never say anything. They just do what we say. And I'm like, wait, what? But why? <laughs> um, so I make, I, make, I make good, good money. Um, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and to that point, right, I'm not motivated by the money. I'm motivated by the mission and the work. Because my first client, um, my first, the first proposal I gave him, um, he took $10,000 off my fee. I think my fee was like $25,000. And I, I, I forgot how I got to that number. Uh, I was like, man, $10,000? Now, right after, I'm like, well, I'm going to walk away from that deal. But it's, again, what is the long-term game, right? Sometimes it's not the short-term game, it's long-term. And I, what, I, what I have to say, there has to be a problem. You have to articulate your value. You have to solve it. So I took $10,000 off off my feet and I did that project and boy did I solve several problems from them from design um innovative material cheaper material everything right and I get another project with the same client they're like oh that was great we're gonna take another fifteen thousand dollars off this feet and I was like what the hell I just did that right long game right now it's it's almost like a joke the formality we go through to get to a contract they, they have never once now ever questioned my fee because I've articulated my value, right? Uh, and I think and I'm, it's lucrative, right? And this is the thing. Big, big affordable housing developers, one of our clients is TCB, the community builders, love them, right? Great people. Um, and we did, we're doing this big project for them in Chicago called Southbridge, right? One of the largest public housing redevelopments happening in the Chicago region. Um, it's a five building master development and they, they're designing two buildings, right? They designed, they were working on two buildings at a time and they had Antunavision Associates designing it. Big, 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 big fancy A&E firm, big, right? And they hated the design. And then they came to us in February and said, we do not like what, and we've done some other work for them. And they're like, we do not like what Antunovich did. Um, can you help redesign it? And I'm, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But this is when people think there's no money in affordable housing. So you just pay big, big, big Antunovich dollars, right? And I keep my overhead costs low intentionally. I like my team small. So if you can pay a big A&D firm like that, you can pay determined by design. Right, but no one is going after them, and the big A and D firms that are taking this work, it, they are doing inadequate design solutions. So we come to a, and then look, then we look like the hero. They come a little little black girl, her design firm, uh, bringing in the community story, making several hundred thousand dollars. Because I know y'all got the money, because you just wasted it on the big white firm, right? So people think like, oh my God, did you do this? No, fool, because these developers got money. They have money and they want to spend it, but you have A and D professionals who are constantly doing less than. And my hypothesis is, oh, the 45 plus year old white man, he's not going to challenge, challenge a developer who's working in the black community because he can't see himself living there. His self, his mother, his father, his sister, his grandmother, no one else. So you don't give a shit. Brother, I do, right? Because these people, these, these developers are spending money. And I have developers saying to me now, like, yeah, you know, Minor Feinstein, we spent $130,000 a unit to renovate a building. And all we got was checkerboard floors in our kitchen and, and these little dinky cabinet pulls because some little white girl just did whatever I said. And I'm just like, how much did you pay them? Okay, now give me that money. And I take it. 
and I'm lucrative, right? Doing affordable housing work. You can do both and. It doesn't have to be either or. Uh, and, and I think that's the biggest thing that, I, and I talk about money a lot because it's like, oh, no, I'm good. We, we, we real good over here. Because um, to do community-based work doesn't mean that you have to be a nonprofit. You don't have to donate your time. Do we donate um, to other nonprofit projects? Absolutely. But the bulk of my work is for-profit, nonprofit developers, city agencies that have tons and tons and tons and tons of funding sources. And um, so in a pandemic, right, um, it's, it's disheartening to see some of my design counterparts who are in hospitality, education, even healthcare, corporate, they're struggling. I'm good. We didn't hire three new people. We got nine new projects. Wow. But I do the poor, poor, poor people's work. Well, I'm good. Wow. Money to be made. Mm. Lindsay, did you have a question where you did you did that unmute yourself lean in? <laughs> oh, you're muted. You're oh. muted. Uh, you're okay, sorry. <laughs> oh, I actually didn't have a question. I'm actually not a student anymore. I graduated um in the summer. But I was just really interested. Thank you. I was really interested to um like hear your talk and and have and, and get some more insight. And I just I love how your design focuses on focuses on serving people. I think for me, that's really what draws me to design as well. And I think design can change people's lives. And that's, you know, where I want to take my career. Mm -hmm. And I also work at a nonprofit in Tallahassee for, um, for affordable housing. And I've done work with Dr. Pablo um, with her um, homelessness um, nonprofit. And I just think, you know, and, and, and I also love the way um, Beauty, beauty is a priority in your, um, oh, yes. in, in affordable housing. Cause I, you know, I see that a lot too. Like people thinking that low income people should just like, like take the scraps, you know? And I love how, yes. like that's, how that's not acceptable for, for, oh, this, for your designs. This is, this is what you're starting to see a lot now. We, we, we want a space that's dignified. We want to bring dignity to these communities. And I'm like, okay, let me get this right. The white woman doesn't go to the insurance designer and say, hey, guys, I want a dignified face for my family. What the, like, what, what? Mm -hmm. dignity is the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. And and we're seeing it, like, constantly now. Like, these spaces should be, dig no, they should be beautiful. They should have adornment. They should be soft. There should be decoration, right? One of the things that I have been really speaking about lately is in, in, in effort to make the industry sound more heady, and, and comparable to our architectural counterparts, we've diminished this idea of decoration, fabric, textile, softness, and adornment, right? Making spaces beautiful and making beauty the standard. Now, well, this should be dignified. And we're, we're working on a project um, called Carpenter Shelter. It's a shelter here in Washington, D.C., um, in Alexandria area. Ooh, and um, the executive director, she let us just have at it with SF and E. We have Bernhardt design furniture in a freaking shelter, right? <laughs> uh, we have Martin Burchard furniture in a shelter, a shelter, right? So if my mindset would have just been like, well, it's a shelter, so we have to go get some Han folding tables and chairs, no shade to Han, um, folding tables and chairs, we have to do all vinyl, and it's just like, no, we push them. Um, well, Kia, should, we re should everything be vinyl? No, because again, us understanding as design professionals, Arcom for years has had institutional grade fabrics uh, that were antimicrobial, bleach cleanable, stain resistance, everything. So it's taking that knowledge that we have um, and giving it to our clients. Um, co um, courtyard furniture from um, Akula, and they, they're, they, they're on like pools and Vegas and everything in a shelter project. Yeah, you know, so that's that's design, right? Mm -hmm. It's not thinking like, oh, because it's a shelter, we have to use this. Um, because it's senior housing, we have to use uh, the senior furniture. Who says? Who says? Our job as designers is the question. Well, well, what makes a chair a senior chair? Seat height and arm height, and if it needs to be bariatric, that's a whole different thing. So one time we specify this chair from Kellex, right? had these black curved arms. It was a little bit modern, right, in this shape. And the client was like, um, I don't think that's a, a senior chair. And I said, well, why not? He's like, well, it's just too much for this demographic. So we always just kind of ignore that statement. He's like, okay, but give me some real reasons. 
Um, so we took the chair to another facility that they own and we left it there for like a week and a half. So I called the property manager and I'm like, hey, I'm coming to pick up that chair. And she's like, here, I'm a little upset. And I was like, why, what happened? And she was like, all the seniors want to know how come they don't have chairs like this, right? So it's our job to constantly challenge this idea of what is applicable for a use. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I like to pick on manufacturing because they market that this is the office chair, the education chair, and for hospitality, and this is the guest chair, right? So you go to a leasing office and you see a guest chair. It's that, you know, plastic arm, mesh back, upholstered seat from Gunlock or um, OFS, right? Well, we use this beautiful wood with leather accents and, and gold um, metallic from Sosejo, which is a Brazilian company, right? And guess what? What makes a guest chair a guest chair? A fucking chair, right? But industry has labeled these things at nauseum that we only think, so I can only go to this manufacturer for this thing, or there's a thousand other ones if we just remove the labels that we've associated to materiality. Um, so when people are like, uh, we, we, we got some Andre World in a shelter, Andre World, right? In a shelter. Um, and they're all about hospitality, high-end, you know, retail spaces. Well, it's in a shelter too, brother, right? It's possible. We just have to change our thinking and let not manufacturing and marketing dictate the design decisions we make. Is that fair? Yes, I love that. Oh, this is, I mean, this burnt hot furniture is like just so out of the world. It's bananas anyway. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. I just get a little excited. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I just wanted to tell you, I, I really admire your mindset and I really think that, you know, our design should be, should focus on people instead of like revenue or uh, anything else. And that reminds me also of uh, Hassan Fatih, he's an Egyptian architect. I don't know if you heard of him. Yeah, he used to, uh -huh. to go to, to uh, villages and and study and analyze the area and design everything and teach people how to build their houses. And then he built, the, he built their houses with them to, to give them, you know, a, a society, to build a society over there. And he used to do that in, in different villages in, in Egypt. So that's great. So I was thinking, you know, I think mainly the problem is not for us and uh, maybe for me, because I care about also affordable housing, that's a uh, topic of my paper. But I think the main problem is with developers. So I was just thinking, do you know if, it, if it's easy to convince developers to have design, to allow designers to have value-driven designs instead of revenue-driven designs? Oh, absolutely. So this is the thing, right? Okay, people buy into people. So when I started looking for developers, I was like, okay, who's going to listen to me? Toby Bizzuto older Jewish white guy, probably not. Monty Hoffman, fifth generation developer, white guy, probably not. And I can lend you like six other white guys, right? And I said, ah, Bula Benici, black guy, immigrant, does affordable housing. Let me start there, right? So when I started my farm, I had no real, no, no, I had no projects of my own to sell, right? Um, and I didn't feel comfortable using work I did at my previous firm, right? I wanted it on my own merit, right? So it starts with finding developers who will buy into you, right? So I started with a developer of, and this is the thing, did it take a lot of research and time to find him? Yeah, right? Because there ain't that many, but it's okay. I had to be intentional with finding the right person first who I felt like would be open to me as a person and then open to hear that, you know what, design is not just about dollars and assets. It is about the people. Did it take five emails to him, his VP, um, running, to them, running into them at events um, three times to get my first contract? Yes but it was about making sure it was the right people to start having that conversation with, right? So you have to, again, kind of be aware who's going to have buy-in. So 
in, in doing that, oh, that was the best thing we've ever done, right? Because I convinced Bua. Bua had buy-in to me, and now I convinced him, and now I brought value to his company as a developer, right? And he was a smaller shop, right? So it's not always looking for the big developer first to tackle the problem. Look for the small to mid-sized development or nonprofit association or housing developer. Look for them first and infiltrate because people people don't like to see a small person come up. So here comes here's this black man, um, immigrant developing affordable house, and it's starting to look good. And then here come the white developers. Oh, who are you using? We want to use them too. And then the white developers started calling us, right? So it's starting with the right people to have the conversation with. And I think we were, I was, I was doing two things at one time. I was on my soapbox saying, make design better, design equity. But I was also understanding, oh, boo is cheap. So I can't spend a lot of money. And I need to document every instance where I save him money. We do more. We do, um, and that first project, we robbed Peter to pay Paul. But at the end of the day, we ended up having 11% more architectural finishes than what the architect specified. And cost for cost material-wise, we still came in under budget by 6%. And on a $50 million deal, that's a lot of money. Now, then what we had to say was, hey, Bua, you know, we still had some added costs because you brought me in so late into the game. If you bring me in earlier, we can make those design decisions and save you money, right? Now, he's like, oh, wait, it can look good, and I don't have to spend any more money, right? So this Capital Vista project I'm talking about, like no VE, all new construction, this is one of Bua's projects, right? Uh, and Bua paid me a lot of money to do that project, right? And I didn't spend more of Bua's money, but it's finding agency with the right people first, and then everyone else will come, right? And and this is the thing. Um, I, I did a speaking, a little speaking thing for DC by DCBI, DC Building Industry Association, right? And Bua's a busy, busy man. He's much fancier than me. Um, he calls in to tell all the white developers. Determined by design is the bomb. We use it on everything you should too, right? And I started with a small brother not trying to go after the big fish. That's how you get to change people's minds. Find the people who will buy into you first and your mission and, and, and show your value. That's, that's how you get change to happen. Is that fair? I think we have time for yeah. one more question before our time. Yelena, you over there smiling, girl. I see you. <laughs> Yes, you're seeing me. Thank you. I'm excited about your uh, very passionate talk about focusing on people and your wonderful success story in design. It's really inspiring, uh, I think, for all of us to hear. So kudos to you. Um, Kia, I have maybe not as related question to you, uh, to the subject of this talk, although it kind of you brought it up um, earlier when you talked about concept development. You mentioned histories are, that are important. I also teach history of design. And uh, mm -hmm. we are kind of going through a big curricular change, right? Incorporating designers of color into our curriculum. But then also kind of I'm, as a big picture, what is the role of history in design? Is it important to you oh. in your practice? Oh, yeah. And for me, it's really... I think history plays a role when we're looking at design vernacular and techniques, but history for me is really about community and figures and people. Um, who 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 were the architects who did, who did the the you know develop these communities? We worked on a building called Archer Park Apartments, and the architect the the building it was named after was Romulus Cornelius Archer who was the second black registered architect in the district, right? Hadn't we not did a little bit deep dive into the history, we wouldn't have got that little nugget of information. And then our entire design concept was based off of buildings that Mr. Archer had, had developed and designed, right? So we implemented some of his projects into the, into, the, um, into the project as digital murals, right? And we did a little bit of a placard. So little brown boys and girls live in a building named after a man who built buildings. So the history piece kind of tells us what's possible. And I think in academia, as you're looking for more um, designers of colors to celebrate, it's one thing to infuse them in the curriculum. 
it's another thing to have them teaching in your programs, right? You need to make them accessible so people can see them. I've had students say to me, I'm thinking of dropping out of the program. My classmates don't look like me. My teachers don't look like me. And am I going to go to an industry and be the only one, right? So I think history, it's about understanding um, how fashion and textiles and making and product, how a lot of that it, it comes from c cultures and ethnicities of color and how do you weave that in, into that process, especially if you're in a more traditional university. I went to an art and design college and we took every art history known to man. Um, mm -hmm. So we, I got, you know, African studies, African art, it, all of it, right? But I think it's bringing in the history, finding the people, um, the historic figures, and not historic in the sense of, you know, well, were they historic because they worked at a big firm or they were in the cover of some magazine, right? How did they do more intentional community-based work? But it's also bringing the history, uh, but bringing them into the educational space. Um, and I think this is the diversity piece everyone wants to talk about. And it has to start in academia, mm -hmm. um, and then it has to start in community. Because if design doesn't meet people where they are, are, how are they going to become exposed to it, right? And no, not every designer of color comes from some impoverished community, but I've been to enough schools, 25 to be exact, upwards of three and four and five times every year, and it never fails those, those one or two black or brown students who say, the dialysis center I went to with my grandmother was shitty, the community, the community center I went to after school was crappy, the hospital, the whatever it is. So people of color, not all, but a good portion, are coming to design curriculums from a place of wanting better, right? So when they get there, if, they're, if their faculty and the programs aren't teaching them about other people who look like them, then, then you're isolating them already right off the bat. Um, and I think that's where it's do a deep dive. Um, and now there's no excuse. There's enough resources out there where – you should have curriculum, firms, speakers, everything of color, and start pulling them in as as um, educators and speakers. And and I challenge, you know, designers of color too. Uh, this one guy, he says, "Oh well, um, I, I I shared the story of why I went back to teaching." And he was like, "Well, I'm an alumni of that university, and there are several of us black designers who went to there, and they don't reach out to us." And it's like, what did I just say? Don't wait for them to come to you. You insert yourself into the problem, right? Um, so it, it, it needs to be reciprocal where if you don't extend the invitation, I'm going to knock on the door and be like, there's a problem here um, in academia and we need to address it because then it's translating into these firms. Um, I know, Jill, we can, I don't think I'm over, but I want to say this one more little thing. No I was talking to... Um, several young designers, and I don't mean age, I mean like they've only been in the profession like three to five years, and they got their brass ring jobs, right, at the big, big firms, and they hated it. And I was like, well, why? And I was like, well, how come you ended up there? And they were like, well, that's all that's marketed to us, the Ginslers, the IAs, the Purchase and Wells, right? Um, and it's like, okay, again, academia, Bring in the small to mid-sized firms, not just small mid-sized firms of color, but some of these small to mid-sized firms who are doing great work in all facets, not just, you know, hospitality, workplace, whatever, but um, it's like you don't just expand the dialogue outside of what's just marketed to us. Uh, and that's no shade or disrespect to some of these big A&D firms, uh, but it's just as education as researchers and gatherers, gather more diverse people from ethnicity, size, practice, and everything, and bring them um, into your institution. And then I think that's where I said, Jill. That was a fantastic answer. Thank you. Yeah, we really thank you for your time. I know you're super busy, but some of the concepts that you uh, talked about, I think we're going to be continuing to discuss and also consider. So. Uh, your influence is, is wonderful, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. People say, oh, you're so busy, but this, this I have to show up, right? Again, I think it's, I didn't have it, so I make sure I do it, and we prioritize, prioritize the things that is important, and I need more designers this next wave to know the power 
and the impact that we have um, and make sure that we are practicing empathy in our design outcomes. Absolutely. Well, thank Can you. Can I so. add one thing, mm -hmm. Jill? I'm just, sure, go ahead. Uh -huh. So obviously, Kia, I've had you know, direct conversation with you separate and apart from this. So I know a little bit about your history, but I love that. And you know what? Fine. I'll share my screen too. I'm sorry. It looks like. <laughs> Hi guys. Um, so I, I love that everything that you do is with intention, you know, and it's intentional. And I think if we as a design community as a whole, every aspect of that community that we take up, whatever piece of it, whatever element, be intentional. And I think that's the point mm -hmm. that Kia was trying to hone in there for everybody is if you have intention, promise you, amazing things will happen along the way. So Kia, mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that. And I hope thank you. Got some amazing Good to see you. 